How's that? All right. Scripture reading in God's Word today is Exodus 29, 45 through 46, and 32 through 8. <clears throat> then I will dwell among the Israels and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves idols cast in the shape of calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Can you hear me? Now uh, you can hear me. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come, Lord, to a warm place to worship you, to a place where we don't have to worry about persecution. Lord, take away any of the distractions that we have and help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and what you are doing through us, through Christ Jesus our Lord. That he gave up heaven, and that he did not consider equality with you, Lord, to be something to be gained, but emptied himself, as Scripture said, so that he could be our atoning sacrifice. The great sin debt that we have forever paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for calling us to be your children. Lord, forgive us when we do grumble and complain. Fill us with your Spirit and direct us by your Spirit. Bring us into maturity. And Lord, help us to be a light in the time that we do have on this earth to be a light, to give up the things that we're concerned about to bring glory and honor to you so that we don't regret that one day. But Lord, that we hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you might have noticed from the passages that we finished reading in Exodus that there was a lot of grumbling and complaining going on. And you know, when I think about that, I think about how much grumbling and complaining that's in my own life. And then I hear a prayer request like Shaylin's, and I'm devastated. You know, I complain about these things in my life when we should be thankful for every breath we have and whatever circumstances that they are, that we have another breath to bring praise and glory and honor to God and to live a life that can be a testament so that hopefully we can tell somebody when they ask us, of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So I entitled this message, I Go to Prepare a Place for You. And I want you to think about that. And that's what Jesus said when he was spending his final hours before he went to the cross. He told those closest to him, even though he knew he was going to be betrayed, even though he knew Peter was going to deny him, even though he knew, the, though he knew whatever parts that he knew, you know, because you don't know what he knew as a man, what, the things he was facing, but he knew enough that he sweat drops of blood, that he was in such trauma. But yet, he said, not my will, Father, but yours, because he knew what was at stake. Yours and my salvation. Redemption, because there was no other plan. It was Christ Jesus, our atoning sacrifice for our sins, so that we could be brought into the presence of God. And as I think of that, I think about all the things through Exodus that we read. And I've told you before, I, I, I kind of want to be there, but I don't want to be there. <laughs> to see the mountains tremble and everything so that I could have a better aspect of fearing the Lord. But on the other hand, I am so thankful that I don't have to experience that kind of fear, that I can experience God's love instead. But I don't want to be complacent and take an easy chair to that love. I want to get a fathom of how great God is. <laughs> And how great my sin debt is that Jesus paid for me. So that's why I entitled this, and that's why I gave the scripture that we gave, because how quickly the Israelites saw all the power of God. 
They saw the plagues. They saw the glory of God. They walked through on dry ground with their enemies destroyed. They saw the mountain tremble and quake, and yet they built false gods that fast and worshipped them. I can't fathom that, but then I look at my own life and I can't fathom a lot of the things that I've done and the lack of faith that I've had and the grumbling and complaining that I have. Who am I to judge? Oh, I'm thinking of James now, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus told me to go and prepare. He was going to go and prepare a place for me so that where he is that I would be forever and ever and ever. So do I believe that and am I living that? God delivered his children in Egypt from slavery so that they could go worship and serve, serve him to present sacrifices, to sing songs of praise, to be obedient, to be a holy set-apart nation so that they could be a light to the world. And as you read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ with those glasses, you see that. You don't see a God just bent on destroying people. You see a God bent on saving people that will do anything and everything to save them, but is also holy and just and will destroy sin so that we know that that place that Jesus is preparing for us will be perfect and we will be a part of it, and nothing will ever be able to separate us from God's love. But what did the children of Israel do? Well, you should have read Exodus chapter 25 through the end of Exodus. You should have read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. You should have read Philemon. You should have read James. So my first question to ask you is, did you? Okay? This time when I read Exodus, I don't know about you, but it was refreshing to me. And I'm going to say that's the first time I've ever used that word for Exodus. But it was so refreshing to see all the detail and instruction and everything to get an experience of how holy God is because I'm not there. I didn't see that. But I see all the detail and all the instructions in here and I see that there is no way that I could ever pay my sin debt. But Jesus did for me. Do I believe this? And am I living this? God is so holy, so patient, so merciful, so loving, so kind, and so just. And He loves me and called me, and I don't have to understand election and predestination and anything else. I just need to know that God loves me enough that He sent His one and only Son to die for me. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that's enough testimony to go tell somebody else. So don't think you can't witness to somebody else because that's all you need. The Spirit will give you the words to say and the closer that you walk in God's Word and the more that you mature and the more that you come to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, the, the, the fact that you can't help but love your neighbors and want to tell them about Jesus Christ. Even those enemies. I am an object of my God's affection. The God who made Pharaoh realize who, who he was but Pharaoh would not believe and he was destroyed. I think of the words, and as I was penning these words, this song came on. It said, Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, not because of what you've, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, and you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. If you don't recognize those words, are from a Casting Crown song, but it's amazing that came on right when I was thinking about this and contemplating this before I started really writing the sermon. Who I am nobody but to God I am everything so why in the world would I not give my life back to praising the one who gave everything to save me so I got to ask you were you refreshed when you read Exodus or was it tedious because you got Job coming up next and you're going to struggle and you've got Leviticus and Numbers and other things coming up but read them with the desire to read them to see God's glory and to see what all He did for you. To see that sacrifices are necessary. So He gave His only Son to save you. 
As you're reading, you want to think, what are all these meticulous guidelines? What is all this intricate detail? Why repeat it over and over? I got that one because I'm thick-headed. <laughs> I got that one easily. How many types of offerings are there? Liquid, peace, burnt grain. Oh, and that sin offering. What does it really mean to be holy? And there's so much blood, blood, blood shed. Oh, not any comparison to God's only Son shedding His blood for me. The, goat, the blood of goats and bulls can never save me. So God sent His Son to die, to ransom, to redeem me back. You read the, the details about um, the ceremonies and festivals that they set up so that we would tell our children over and over. So I've got to think literally how much I have failed at telling my child over and over, even though I brought him up in the church and everything else. But there's still tomorrow, isn't there? There's still today, isn't there? There's still the day after. If the Lord gives me the breath to do it, I will proclaim His name with joy. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. You know that hymn. And it goes on to talk about your hands and how they move, your feet and where they go, your voice and how you sing, your lips and how you, how you tell, your money and how you use it, and your intellect and how you use it. Do you do the things of that hymn that we sing so much? So think about what the priests do also. There's so much work to do because there's such a big sin debt. There's so many offerings that have to be made. And then you see all the details in the, in the construction of everything down to the, to the priest's uniform, to everything else. It's serious because of the seriousness of God's holiness and the seriousness of our debt that has to be erased. Totally permanently erased. Jesus did that for me. And He did it for you. So as we read 1 Peter and tie that in, and I go, we're doing 1 Peter in Sunday school, and you ladies are doing it, I think, still in Bible study? Okay. 1 Peter chapter 1. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, He knew all this, and sanctified by the Spirit, for what? Obedience to Jesus Christ. And sprinkled by His blood, we're able to do that because the sacrifice of atonement has been made. Grace and peace be yours, and not only it be yours, but be it in abundance. Skipping down to 13, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Peter goes on in 1 Peter chapter 2 to say this, to give us more instructions. Rid yourselves therefore then of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all slander. Okay, I'm not trying to check them off, but I failed there some. Okay? Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Know that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to Him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So apply what you've read from Exodus Apply the job of the priest to your job today. It's not just my job. It's your job, your job, your job, your job, your job. It's our job together collectively to bring God, to present Him how holy He is, how loving and kind He is, how merciful He is, and how He will judge the living and the dead. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you put your faith and trust in Him, you will be saved from God's wrath. God was building and preparing His children to worship and serve Him so that they would be a light to their world. And that generation that left didn't even enter into the promised land except for two men who wholeheartedly, I'm going ahead in what you're reading is, serve the Lord. They didn't doubt, they didn't waver. Even though there were giants in the land, Jesus is building His church. His brothers and sisters. He's building them for eternal worship, for worship here and now, for service here and now, and for 
eternal rest that is above, beyond what you can possibly imagine. All of those details, expounding on the law, ceremony, sacrifice, and so much blood. And Jesus paid it all for me. So our scripture from this morning was from Exodus 29 and Exodus 32. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. God preparing for His children so that He could come into their presence. And they will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. How in the world could they say that the gods of Egypt brought them out of Egypt? That's in Exodus if you didn't catch it. How could they longingly look back to where they were and say at least we would die there with our bellies full basically? Exodus 32, three chapters later, how quickly they have turned aside from the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have bowed down to it. They have sacrificed to it and said, These, O Israel, are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. A golden calf that even Aaron said, I told them to get, bring their gold and everything, and I threw it in a fire, and literally a calf came out for them to worship. How many times in my life have I thought such stupid thoughts? And I can tell you one right now, and I'm not going to tell you what it was. <laughs> but how I could have thought God was involved in that at that time. Wow. <clears throat> if Moses was to lead the people to the promised land, to vineyards that they didn't build, and homes that they didn't build, a land flowing of milk and honey, how much greater is the place that Jesus is preparing for you? And he said to you, I go and prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you will be. Exodus chapter 34. There are new stone tablets given to God's children. You know the story, so I won't go back there that much. He renews his covenant even though they have been so rebellious. <laughs> All the miracles they saw and they give credit to Egyptian gods and bow down to worship them. But he renews his covenant. Moses spends 40 days up on the mountain. He, he, uh, we read all about the festivals and the offering, and Moses comes down from the mountain delivering the law, and his face glowed where he had to put a veil on it because the people were scared seeing Moses glow from God's glory. But you with uncovered faces, you don't have that veil anymore, do you? Doesn't Scripture tell you that? Well, let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Now if the ministry, remember ministry means serving or service. If Moses is serving, if that ministry that he gave to the people brought death, which was engraved in letters of st stone, and it came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Will it not? <laughs> Verse 9, If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings true righteousness forever and ever and ever? Because once you believe you are a child of God seated in the heavenly realms and nothing can take that away from you. Is that what you believe? For what was glorious has no glory in comparison with surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory that, that of that which lasts? Therefore, that means since you've heard this, this is tying together the argument or, or whatever it is, I won't use argument, the facts that have been stated here. Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only Christ, only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when, they read, when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. <laughs> I'm so glad this time I can use the word refreshing when I read Exodus. Because I know there's no veil there. 
I'm not saying there was before, but I know there's not now. I see God's glory and how the lengths that he went for his people to worship him and serve them the way that they should, to be his children, but they couldn't. They failed. I fail, but I can do it through the ministry of the Spirit because I am a new creation in Jesus Christ, and I have to remember that every time that I do fail so that I let God lift me up and continue to walk this path of faith, even run this race with perseverance, throwing in away anything that entangles, and especially the sins that are still in my life. Verse 16, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, there's that but, those glorious buts in the Bible. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate. So do you contemplate the Lord's glory? If, if, if we have the veil taken away and we think about God, we are being transformed to His image with ever-increasing glory. That's why Romans 12 tells us to get rid of the old things so that the Spirit can transform the way that we think so that we change the way that we live. And this comes from the Lord who is Spirit. So it's time for me to evaluate and spend some time thinking about that. And that's what I did before I wrote any further. How am I living? Am I being transformed? Am I being like Christ? Do I see His ever-increasing glory in my life? Oh, and as I do that, I see that we will be raised up just as Christ Jesus was raised up to glory. Exodus chapter 35. I'm an entire list. Giving your best in money, time, and talent to the Lord. Did you read Exodus 35 that way? Did you read any chapter that way? Let me read it to you. Exodus 35, chapter 1. Then Moses assembled the whole congregation of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on that day must be put to death. Okay, I can view this with a veil over my face, or I can view it with a veil off. Let's try. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses also told the congr whole congregation of Israel, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a an offering to the Lord. Let everyone whose heart is willing, who's willing, bring an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. Do you remember reading that? That's why you need to read this. They brought so much that they finally said, Stop! We have more than we need. All this detail, we're going to put all this gold, all this bronze, all of these jewels, which weren't theirs in the first place. They came from Egypt where God took them out of and stripped them of, them of the wealth that they relied on as their gods after destroying all their other gods that they thought they relied on and then bringing death because they didn't have the blood of the covenant covering them. And the angel of death passed and they lost their firstborn children. Ironically, Pharaoh lost his who gave the edict to kill all the firstborn of, of Israel. Maybe the people then at that point realized that their riches weren't theirs and maybe they realized their lives weren't there. That God had richly given them so that they could be rich to others. So that they could provide justice and equality. So they could be a light to the world. Hmm. Now that takes me to think about that rich guy. Which rich guy? The one that walked away from Jesus? The one whose life was taken away that day? The one who was a good steward of all God gave him? Well, it made me think of all of them, don't worry. Because <laughs> all I want to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then I want to hear a voice cry out like that song says about the Sunday school teacher, Alan! Because they know me because I told them about Jesus. Look how much they gave. Exodus chapter 38. The whole community of Israel gave. 7,000, I'm reading from the New Living Translation because it gives it in numbers that I can understand. <laughs> 7,545 pounds of silver as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. This silver came from the tax collected from each man registered in the census. <clears throat> The tax, is, the tax is one becca, which is a half a shekel based on the sanctuary shekel. The tax was collected from 600,550 3, men. I told you I could understand these numbers, but I have a little trouble still. Who had reached their 20th birthday. 
The hundred bases for the frames of the sanctuary wall and for the posts supporting to the inner curtain required 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds for each base. For each. The, the, the remaining 45 pounds of silver was used to make the hooks and the rings to overlay the top of the post. The people also brought as special offerings 5,310 pounds of bronze. Oh, we're rich, rich, rich in this country. What do we do with the money that we have? Do we build up castles on sand? I said castles too. I didn't just say homes or lodgings. Castles. Because compared to the rest of the world, these are castles. Or do we use our riches to the one who richly gives us to us so that we can bring glory and honor to his name however he tells us to use it? Oh, would we be like that young ruler that kept all the commandments and then walk away? Because their gods are our money or our health or our family or whatever they are. Hey, who's this guy? Bezalel. Close? <laughs> okay. Who's that guy? His name is mentioned six times in Exodus. He's a guy that came out of the shadows. He gave all to God and built all these things God gave him because God gave him the talent to do this. We don't know what he did with his life before. We don't know what he did with his life afterwards. But we know what God called him to do. And he used his, his talents and all of these riches to build the things for the tabernacle and for the priest robes and for the uh, elements of the, the bases and the candles and, and so forth. Who is he? Doesn't matter, does it? You know what his name means? Do you? Shadow of God. He came out of the shadows, went back in the shadows, didn't care. All he cared about was giving his all to God and using what God gave him. Am I doing that? Are you doing that? Are we fully content with living a life that God has given us no matter what the calling is? In, in Exodus, in the last two chapters... You might have seen a pattern, just as the Lord commanded. All this was done just as the Lord commanded, just as the Lord commanded, just as the Lord commanded. Do you think there's a pattern? Does that pattern apply to your life? Exodus chapter 40, after Moses inspected everything to see if it was just as the Lord had commanded, the tabernacle was completed. The whole Jewish calendar and everything is set up around a tabernacle a temporary dwelling place in the wilderness. A tent. Paul talks about a tent. even says our bodies are a tent. This temporary thing, all this extravagance, because Jesus is preparing an eternal home for me. If this was glorious, how glorious is that? Do I see it that way? Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, Then the cloud covered the temple, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I can't fathom. Moses could no longer enter the temple because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. Remember, their journey is to go to the promised land. And they are to worship and serve Him along the way so that they'll know how to do it when they get there. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. I love the part that says the whole family. This continued throughout their journeys. This is how Exodus ends. We know Genesis and the beginnings and the faith of the different people there and our sin and how it accumulated to the point where God almost wiped out mankind, but He didn't because He's faithful and made a covenant. And even though there was only one person righteous, Noah, his family entered into the ark, how many more people are going to enter into eternity with God because of what Jesus Christ did? Moses didn't enter the promised land because he couldn't carry them there, but Jesus will. The law can't carry us there because we're all guilty of it. It only condemns us. Even the most righteous of, it, of us realize when we get to the, the covet one, Paul I'm talking about here, whoops, I blew it. 
This young rich ruler that I talked about thought he had done all the commandments. You know, Jesus specifically gave him the commandments that related to other people. He didn't realize that he had other gods that he, could, he had to get rid of. Oh, Lord, please take the veil off my face. Let me see your glory. Let me serve you wholeheartedly with everything that I have. We didn't start Leviticus, we, but I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. You saw that the end of Exodus uh, ended with Moses standing out of the tabernacle and he couldn't enter. Leviticus 1 starts this way. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle. See, God isn't done with his people. He wasn't done with his people for thousands of years, even when there was silence in the land. That's why a voice came out crying in the wilderness that the light was coming, Jesus coming into the world, so that he could redeem you so that your light would shine before others, so that they see the glories of God and turn to worship him. God goes on in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 2, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, and that's where I'm going to stop because Leviticus is so much in sacrificial elements and stuff. So when you do read it, after you read Job and the quandary of, of what's going on out there in the spiritual realm, you'll think about sacrifice, 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 what Jesus sacrificed for you. But I didn't forget about Second Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers, from all believers, who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they receive from us. Maybe Israel needed these words of Paul back then. Oh, I need them now. Verse 7. For you know that you ought to imitate us. Okay, so how did they live? They lived like Jesus in this world. They gave up everything. They didn't care about the cost. They cared about proclaiming the hope that they had in Jesus Christ so that others could be saved. No greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends. Onesimus, he's not a very big character in the Bible either. He was a prisoner who had been set free and goes back to serve his master. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon urging him to accept him as a brother in Christ, not as a slave, but as a brother who is willing to still serve as a slave because he wants his testimony to shine, his light to shine. And then we read James, of course. That one should have got you. Should every time you read it. How do I live? Am I a reader of God's word, a hearer? And does it stop there, or do I obey and do I do? What about? James gives us plenty of, uh, of examples of how faith without works is dead, of ways that we should live our lives. And then he talks about that tongue, doesn't he? I constantly go back to, if it's not edifying, don't say it. But you know what? I think about that after I've said all these things I shouldn't have said already which means I had all these thoughts already that I didn't have. And I'll be accountable for all of them. Forgive me, Lord. Transform the way I think so that I can be more like Christ, so that I am not a stumbling block, but instead I am a light that shines brightly. Your tongue is like, James says, I'm going to take his words and throw them out a little bit differently, a flamethrower. <laughs> so what is your tongue throwing out? It shouldn't be that a tongue throws out blessings and cursings. You don't get bitter and drinkable water from the same fountain, do you? No man can tame it, though. So that means that only one person can tame it. Jesus Christ, living in and through me, can change me totally, 100%, sanctify me through and through. It should be the process, the path that I'm on. So pray and believe what you pray. And ask for wisdom. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition... There you will find disorder in every evil practice. 
But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Chapter 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? No, that's not me. Oh, well, maybe let me should examine myself a little bit more and see where, what's coming from my mouth, which is coming from my heart. Forgive me, Lord. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Oh, this is going back to the Sermon on the Mount, going back to Ten Commandments, isn't it? You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask for the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? I can't see myself ever longing to go back to Egypt, but boy, I can see a lot of stuff that I have done and still do. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us, to tabernacle with us? But He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture say God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oh, all these instructions I have about cleanliness and everything. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and He will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it yourselves, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy you. Who are you to judge your neighbor? James chapter 5 ends this way. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the errors of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. James has a strange ending. There's no doxology. There's no prayer there. There's no, no further instruction per se there. Just a call for God's children, Israel, the church, to go out and save others. Not by anything that you do, but by the way you live and how Jesus lives through you so that they're drawn to God. It's not your job to save them, but it is your job to profess to the ends of the earth and train up disciples to write it on the doorpost, to talk about it when you get up, when you sit down, when you go to bed, all day long with a wholehearted heart. Whether you have to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness before you enter the promised land or not, you're faithful and wholeheartedly loving and serving the Lord and being a testimony to others. So are you? In what ways? Okay, what about what sacrifices are you giving, are you offering to God? How often are you offering them? Are you offering them in a holy manner? You know, Aaron's sons were taken because they offered worship to God in an unholy manner. I cannot fathom that. But God is God. He is just and kind, and I don't deserve His mercy or His grace. But yet He gives it to me because He called me and I answered because of what Christ Jesus has done. So I'll read again. Submit yourselves to God then. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ah, I need to change the way I think. Grieve, mourn, and wail about it. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. It won't stay that way. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And you'll see what's truly important in this world. You'll see what's true treasures. What if you led two people to the Lord, who led two people to the Lord, who led two people to the Lord? I did the math. Had 24 sets of zeros if you take 25 years each time to do it since Jesus Christ was here till now. There's not that many people that have ever been born and died. We would, have, we would all be in heaven now because the number that should have came to God should have came to God. 
Are we living for God? I started thought about bringing the hand out in, but like, no, it'll just distract. But look at those numbers. I can't even fathom them. Because exponentially how that would go. And you know who would be in those numbers? My children and my grandchildren and their grandchildren. Because I wrote His laws on my heart and on my, everywhere I went because I was protected by not the blood of a goat but by the blood of Jesus Christ. So death passes over me. Do your job until Jesus returns. February 28th, devotional. Said committed and consistent. It was a story of Caleb's life. He entered the promised land. I said that before. Him and Joshua. <laughs> Joshua. There's a Greek word called gongudzo. It means to murmur, mud, mutter, grumble, complain, low and almost unheard. It's used eight times in the New Testament. First time it was used was in Matthew 20, verse 11, when the workers grumbled at the end of the day that the people who in the last hour came into work were given the same wage. It doesn't matter when you were that light to the world that drew someone to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago or if it's tomorrow or at your deathbed. Your job is to be a light to this world. So stop grumbling. And three times in John chapter 6 it's used. In verse 41, verse 43, and verse 61. The Jews did not like hearing, I am the bread of life. So that takes me all back to Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness, and they're grumbling and complaining. And Jesus answers them and says, stop grumbling. It's a command. The disciples even grumble still, so he says, does this offend you? All this because Jesus said, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. Unlike your fathers who ate manna and died... The one who eats this bread will live forever. So what are you eating? What are you drinking? Verse 66 is so sad. From that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 10, this is the last time that it's used in the New Testament. I'll take you up to that point. He writes prior to that in verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. That's from Exodus 12, verse 23. Now these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of this ages has come. So the one who thinks he is standing firm should be careful not to fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. They just look different today. Idols look totally different. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, tying this together, my beloved, flee from idolatry. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, the spies go into the promised land and report back. And they all grumble and complain. To the point they want to stone Moses and Aaron. Joshua and Caleb stand up and say, no, no, no. What everybody has said is true. There are giants in the land, but everything God has said is true. There are fortified cities. There's land flowing milk and honey. There's houses and vineyards and everything. And he said he would give us this land. Do you trust him or not? Do you remember the miracles he did or do you want to go back to Egypt? Who is your God? Who are you bowing down to? And like I said, only Joshua and Caleb out of that generation went. Hebrew uses two words for grumbling. Loon and tell you not. Let me, let me tell you the way I pronounce that. Tell you not. Because you're probably not going to hear God's voice if you've got too many idols. Because there might be that point where you've hardened your heart so much, just like Pharaoh, you won't hear him anymore. Loon is a strange word. It means to lodge or remain. Huh? And to murmur and complain. It has a couple definitions. 
And tell you not means that you're just obstinate. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation to said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Wow. But yet Jesus didn't crumb, come off that cross when he was insulted so much, did he? Because God didn't change his character here in the wilderness either, did he? You know that his promises are true. In Exodus 15, 24, that's right after the deliverance song that was given. The people murmured against God and said, What will we drink? In Exodus 16, 2, after water was given, they complained to Moses and Aaron and said, What will we eat? And in Exodus 16, 17, we see both of these words used that I told you about because they're obstinate because they continue to grumble and complain and their hearts are growing hard. So Moses and Aaron, verse 6 of Exodus 16, said to the Israelites, In the evening you will know that, that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling, tell you not, <laughs> against him. Who are we that we should grumble, loon, against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling. Tell you not, because you're not the ones going to enter into the promised land, except for two. Who are we? You are not grumbling, tell you not, against us, but against the Lord. And then that story I read you in Numbers about them getting to the the door of the promised land and them still complaining and murmuring both words are used several several times in Numbers chapter 14 homework go read Numbers 14 for yourselves so you understand what I'm talking about because you shouldn't have read that don't think you missed it okay only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land out of a nation that left Egypt of millions wow no wonder Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. To the point so much where his disciples said, well, who can then? No one without Jesus Christ leading the way. So is he leading your life? I'll close with this story about that one rich man. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 19. It's recorded in Mark chapter 10. It's recorded in Luke chapter 18. It's another real life story, not a parable, of a man that obeyed the law down to the letter of the law, so he thought, but he didn't know God. He did not know Jesus. And he walked for, away from eternal life that day. Maybe someone's light shined enough that brought him back one day. That's what I hope. I hope that's the rest story, but I don't know. But I know that day he walked away and was sad. And it was wept bitterly is what that means. Not sad is like what we think. Because he wasn't willing to give up his gods. Jesus told him to obey the law at first. And, and Jesus told him the commands. And you've got to read each of those to see all this. The commands that dealt with others. And Mark even said, love your neighbor as yourself. Covered all the basics of the law that deal with other people. And you know, those are the ones I think I struggle with the most. But the reason I struggle with the most with them is because God is not sitting on His throne the right way in my heart. He is, don't get me wrong. He's there. But I still have idols that I need to humble myself and get rid of. This man said that he obeyed all those laws and Jesus did not question him about it. He answered him this way. He said, you lack one thing. One thing that will keep you from eternal life? That's the question that he asked. It doesn't matter if there's 10 things, 10 million things. If there's one thing, there is one thing, isn't there? That stops you from inheriting eternal life. And he goes on to say, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, if you want to be mature, then do this one thing also, and you not only will see eternal life, but you'll be complete. Because God will finish the good work that He started in you. Get rid of your other gods. Maybe that's not the way you said it, but he did. He said, sell everything that you have because these are the gods that you have. Sell them. What does that mean then? To barter them, trade them. Well, how long should it take? What should I get for them? There's so many questions you've got to answer, Lord. No, he doesn't. Everything. Not, not part of it? No. Every bit of it. Anything that entangles you. Give the money to the poor then and you will have treasures in heaven. 
then come and follow me. Hmm. Mark even says, before Jesus said these words, he looked at the man with love, compassion, because you can't save yourself. You are pitiful, naked, and blind. And that's why Jesus stands at the door and knocks and asks you to let him enter in and have fellowship to tabernacle with him. So why do I struggle with, uh, how do I do this, Lord? How long should it take? How, how, how much should I sell and give where? Or should I just cast everything aside and follow Jesus and then not even worry about it? Oh, that's extreme, isn't it? But how much do you love Jesus? He might not be telling you to sell everything today, but he might be telling you that there is something you need to get rid of that you need to love a little bit more. You need to think about this enemy that, that you have this grudge with, whatever. I don't know, and I'm not pointing fingers. I got plenty pointed at myself so that I can be a better testimony, a better light, a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather, a better pastor, a better businessman, whatever it is, so that my light shines, so that when people come to see and ask me because they've seen that hope that I am living, that God will give me the words to say then because I love him so much because of how he loves me through Christ Jesus. So how am I worshiping? How am I praying? How am I sacrificing? How am I living as though this was the last breath I would take? What is the hope that I profess that I say that I have? Can you see it in my life? Can others see it in yours? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We praise you for your word for all the things that Israel did that shows us we can never, ever, ever pay our sin debt. We can never follow your law, no matter how self-righteous that we think that we are. Oh God, humble us, give us a contrite spirit. Write your laws on our hearts again and again and again because we are stiff-necked, rebellious people. And forgive us as Jesus forgave us and laid down his life for us. May we follow him with the power of the Holy Spirit and be a light to this world until we meet him face to face. And may we hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.